Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a new report on urban sprawl is critical of the Phoenix area. Tax season may have ended, but there's no end to tax fraud. And we'll learn how some folks are learning to paint with a twist. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona's latest jobless rate remains unchanged at 7.3%. That's according to figures released today by the Arizona Department of Administration. State economist Aruna Murthy blames the sequester and cuts to federal defense spending for Arizona's stagnant job numbers. The national unemployment rate also remained unchanged, but at a lower 6.7%. Focus on sustainability looks at a new report by Smart Growth America, a group that advocates for reduction in urban sprawl. The study shows that the Phoenix area does not do well when it comes to utilizing land. Grady Gamage Jr. is with ASU's Global Institute of Sustainability. He's a senior sustainability scholar at the Institute, and he joins us now. It's good to see you again. Good to be here, Ted. Uh, new report ranked city by urban sprawl. We are ranked 173rd. What's going on here? Actually, it's yes, we're 173rd. Tucson is 100. 171st. Yay. So this is a really complicated study. It's done by the University of Utah and Smart Growth America. It is probably the most complex and comprehensive way to try to look at urban sprawl. So let me try to explain the way they do it. The way they do this is they say there are four components to urban sprawl. The first one is overall density. Okay. And Phoenix get, and, and the way they rank this is if you're above 100, you're doing better than the national average. If you're below 100, you're doing worse. Phoenix is significantly above the average of the 200 largest cities on that factor. We're actually fairly dense. So we get 111 on that factor. Um, I, I went through their rankings. We'd be 20th of the cities on density. Hmm. We're not a low density city. Interesting. The next factor they have is land use mix, which is sort of the ratio of jobs to housing. Again, we're above the national average, just a little bit above. We do pretty well on that one. The third one they call activity centering. And this is about how many people work in compact areas. The cities that do well on this are ones that have very intense downtowns where most people work. Phoenix doesn't do so well. Our downtown isn't a real high percentage of our work base. So here we rank a 96, so we're just below the national median. The last one is street connectivity, and this is about um, having lots of streets that intersect each other so it's easy to get around. We're good on that. You know, this is a farming town originally, and so we have that grid that makes it work well. So we get 111 on that. So on all four of those statistics, we're not too bad. And in fact, if you look at some of them, we're better than Tucson, which ranks higher than us on every single statistic. But then they do an adjustment for population. And here's why Phoenix ranks bad. Phoenix is a really big city now. And when you compare us to other big cities, most of the other big cities are older, more traditional cities. So no surprise here, New York ranks the best, San Francisco ranks the second, Philadelphia's high on the list. We are the, the largest of the sort of purely post-war cities. Only Houston is, is bigger than us. Los Angeles is very high on the list. It does very well. Los Angeles is a very high density city. People don't understand that. So essentially, in my view, we suffer in this ranking by being compared to a lot of smaller communities. Santa Barbara is like fourth I on was, the list. I saw that on the, yes. And here's what's really weird. That's a place I know very well. They, they lump together Santa Barbara and Santa Maria, which are two cities in Santa Barbara County. They're 60 miles apart yeah. with nothing in between them but each of them is relatively compact. So smaller cities tend to look pretty good on that measure. Bigger cities tend to suffer in this report. So I, I, I think it's uh, not an entirely logical methodology. I know State Street there in Santa Barbara is the main drag and yeah. everything seems to revolve yeah, around that until you get to the beach. A, it's a great place, yeah. it's, you know. And, and the, the dilemma of Phoenix is that not a, lot, not a high percentage of people work downtown. People work all mm -hmm. over in Phoenix. And we don't have a lot of these sort of cool urban nodes. We have downtown Phoenix, we have downtown Tempe, we have Old Town Scottsdale, Glendale, maybe, you know, a few places. 
All right, so we got this, we got the rankings and we're trying to figure out what's happening here. And these are just numbers, this is just a ranking system. Let's talk about urban sprawl. What is urban sprawl? Well, and therein lies the whole problem. It, it, it's, it's one of these, I know it when I see it things, like pornography is to the Supreme Court. People mean something by urban sprawl and it depends on how you view it. Most people use sprawl as a pejorative term, as, a, as something they don't like. But even a lot of people who live in what others would call sprawl use sprawl that way. So to many people, particularly on the East Coast, I think, anything that is um, a city based on single family homes, detached single family homes, and automobiles as the dominant mode of transportation is presumptively urban sprawl. Well, that's most of America, frankly, and it's certainly all of the post-war cities. I don't like that definition. I don't agree with that. I think urban sprawl, if you want to make it a pejorative term, should be viewed as the redistribution of a population of a city into a lower density form. That's what's happened to a lot of American cities since, since the Second World War. Philadelphia got a third larger while it lost half its population. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not what happens to Phoenix. Phoenix has always been an automobile dominated city and Phoenix is one of the American cities that gets more dense every year. So I don't think Phoenix is the poster child for sprawl that you might believe it to be if you came from somewhere else. Is sprawl necessarily bad? It, it, it depends on how you want to use the word. Most people use the word as a, a, a term of indictment, as an approbation, as a negative thing. I don't think a, an urban form centered on single family homes and automobiles is necessarily bad. Um, and that's to me where Phoenix is. I don't want to use sprawl the way most people do. And yet the study would say that economic growth, better in high density areas. The health of the population, better in high density areas. So there are some studies that seem to suggest sprawl or at least uh, lower density not so good for us. Right, and, and I think there is truth to that. Um, but, but, but in Phoenix, for example, our average urban density of the metropolitan area is about 2,900 people a square mile. That's not remarkably low. That's right in the middle of American cities. As I said earlier, we'd be close to the top 20 here uh, on their list for density issues. However, you know, having said that, it is true that environments where people walk more, they're healthier environments where people can ride bikes, they're healthier. Um, and I think there is a lot of evidence that environments where people congregate and gather and sort of celebrate urban life um, may be healthier as well and, well, and, and better. And well, so, okay, with that in mind, what can Phoenix do to tackle sprawl as anyone wants to define? Can zoning laws be changed? Can mixed use be encouraged? And can cities do it by themselves? Do you need a county? Do you need the state to help you? Well, we're, we're, the truth is we're doing a lot of that. Phoenix in particular is trying really hard to shift the way we think about density. Um, it, it is uh, possible to make some significant changes. But let me give you an example of one of the things we ought to do. We have a lot of parts of, of Phoenix where we have one house on a fairly sizable lot. And there's significant evidence that going into the future, an awful lot of people are gonna have parents who need to move in with them, or kids who come back from a failed career or a failed marriage who wanna move in with them. We need to create a more multi-generational lifestyle, which means increasing the density of those neighborhoods, which means allowing people to build granny flats and guest house type things on the back of houses. Well. You're going to try to change the zoning in the neighborhood to do that, and you will immediately get lots and lots of opposition. Trust me, I've been there. I've, I've felt the sting of that. So it, it's difficult to make these shifts, but we're trying to do it. And with that in mind, I guess my, my, my final question is here. This is, this is interesting stuff, and it's certainly something to strive for, I guess. Although, do Arizonans, and Phoenicians in particular, do Arizona residents want density? You know... Some do, and I think there is increasing evidence that people are willing to accept that. I know, okay, so I'm a baby boomer, and I'm thinking that I'm going to need to make a lifestyle change one of these days. I like my three-quarter acre lot. I like my swimming pool. I like my backyard. But I could see moving into a higher density environment. There are a lot of things as the baby boomers age that I think will create pressure to be more urban in character. I think we're willing to change somewhat, but we change in increments. Cities change in increments. 
we're not going to suddenly become Greenwich Village. We're going to add a little more density every year to the urban fabric of this place. Is, is there the will, though, to look at infill developments? You can drive around Phoenix all day long and find empty lots, empty tons Absolutely, of and every city will give you a list of the great things they are doing to encourage infill and, and how they're trying to get developers to do that. But as somebody who often represents real estate developers, let me tell you, it is still easier to go to the edge because you don't have the problem of the immediately adjacent neighbors who didn't want that property to develop. And though infill ought to be easier because it already has streets and it already has infrastructure, it is almost invariably more difficult to do. As someone who cares about this area, lived your whole life here, I mean, this, this, this is your home, you say it's easier to go to the edge. Should it be easier to go to the edge? You know, it, it is very difficult to set up a system that makes it more difficult to go to the edge. And we have been so good at that for so long. Um, I, I don't think we ought to discourage that. I think we ought to encourage infill. But in fact, we are one of the cities in the country where what we build on the edge is actually relatively dense. You know, we build small lots on the west side that are frankly smaller than a lot of the traditional lots we have closer to downtown Phoenix. That's unusual. Many cities in this country, you drive 10 miles out of town and you see people living on five and 10 acre tracts. That's not what Phoenix is like. You drive five or 10 miles out of town and you see people living on 5,000 square foot lots. But I guess that the key is if you drive five, 10 miles out of town, you need to see some businesses there. You need to see some shopping there. You need yep. to see something besides a bunch of rooftops. Yep. And businesses follow rooftops. Yeah. You got to have the people first. All right. Great. It's good to see you again. Thank you good so much for here. joining us. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The deadline for filing taxes has come and gone, but the concern over tax fraud remains. Joining us now is Brian Watson of the IRS Criminal Investigation Division and Anthony Forchino of the Arizona Department of Revenue. It's good to have you both here. We've got a lot of things to talk about. So let's get it started with the idea of scams in and of themselves. Do they differ after April 15th? Well, they're more common during the tax season, but we do see scams all year round. We're seeing this telephone scam that really has nothing to do with tax season. People are getting calls from foreign countries being told that they need to pay money to the IRS. They're under, under investigation. If they don't pay, they're going to be deported. They're going to lose their license. They're going to get arrested. And people are scared to death. Is this the kind of thing that we've seen in the past? Is this something new? It's much more prevalent. I mean, there's always been phone scams or, and there's always variations of it. And there's a lot of bad people out there who are always trying to steal money. But this one is really rampant. It is, uh, we're seeing a lot, I, I'm based in Tucson, we're seeing a lot of it in Pima County, but we're also seeing it all over the country. And, and they're targeting, a lot of the people are people that were not born in the United States. And so when you use that word deportation, yes. they get scared to death, they panic, and they send the money, and then they find out later that money just went to, to a foreign country, and there's really no way of getting it back. And also, and you know, the, uh, utilities turned off, and, and these sorts of things. Again, is this something that you would see maybe more of after April 15th? Those type of scams you might see more after after April 15th, but uh, we continue to see uh, the, the fraudulent refund uh, all year long. People are, are filing those tax returns. And what it is by fraudulent refund, what I mean is someone is filing an, uh, 
a tax return for someone that doesn't exist or someone that's out of state or someone who has died and they have gotten their identity and then file a tax return. Did you see more of this when the economy was bad? Is this the kind of thing that if the economy starts booming again, we might see less of or more of? I, I don't think the, the economy really has anything to do with it. I think it's the okay. fact that, that these uh, rings and people are out there. When we seen more was the fact that we went to more electronic more electronic filing so they have an easier way to get those fraudulent returns in. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? Has the electronic filing system kind of changed the landscape here? Yes, it's a, it's a dual-edged sword. I mean, electronic filing is great because there's less uh, mistakes on your tax return. You get your money back faster. It's just a much better, more efficient system. Same way when we went to direct deposit for people's payroll and Social Security benefits. But the downside of the technology is there's much more ways for your identity to be stolen. And it's also easier for criminals instead of having to mail in ref, uh, checks or uh, tax returns to get a refund check, they can do it from the safety of their own house. <laughs> it does sound, though, that you have to be somewhat sophisticated to have this kind of wherewithal, don't you? I mean, we're not talking common to folks here. To get no, there, it, 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 it runs the whole range. There's people who are street-level criminals who are just filling it out at their house, and there's very sophisticated rings. Some of them are overseas, and a lot of them are using anonymizers and different internet techniques to basically hide where, where the, their internet is coming from. Is that what you're seeing as that's, well? That's also what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot from, from uh, other countries and all. And, and the state has a little different even than the federal because what's happening for us is people are taking uh, social security numbers and identities of people that don't live in Arizona so they can file an Arizona return mm -hmm. and that person would never know that that return wasn't being filed. So what kind of resources does the state have in terms of this kind of activity? Uh, currently we have a, a unit that, that actually looks at that but we also have our system which which bounces returns as they come in against different databases, IRS databases, different databases. And plus, we have a conference every month with every state. And, you, and I think a lot of what we're talking about here, not the telephone scams, but the idea of, of filing false returns, ID theft is a major factor here. Talk yes. about that. And what happens if your ID is stolen and your refund doesn't show up? Well, what a lot of times happens, people will file a tax return They'll get a notice back from us saying, you've already filed. And the person says, wait a minute, I haven't filed. They're a victim of ID theft. So what it does is it starts a process. It can be very painful. It takes time, stress, um, phone calls, waiting on hold, filling out paperwork. I agree, it's a hassle. When your identity is stolen and it just happened to a friend of mine, and when it happens to a friend, it really hits home because you realize that's a real person. And it, you will get your refund back. It's not like your refund's been stolen, but it may take three to six months to get it straightened out. We will get it fixed, but you're gonna have to be patient. So that's one of the reasons we you know, tell people don't have huge withholdings. You don't wanna have a giant refund waiting for you because in case something does get held up, that money might, you might need that money to pay rent or pay your mortgage, and it's not good to have a huge refund waiting. On the state level, what happens if someone's return has been hijacked? We the same thing. We do the same thing. If if your if a return comes in first and then you file your tax return, we're going to go through the same process of making sure your identity is who you are and that you have that legitimate refund coming to you. Are you seeing again this kind of ID theft more lately? Less? Same? Uh, ID theft continues to grow. It's it is just continuing to grow. Interesting. Another thing that I, I was fascinated by is this this idea of fraud by tax return preparers. Yes. My goodness gracious, talk about this. Well, we want them to be the pillar of our financial community. You should be able to trust them. And the vast majority of return preparers are honest, they're ethical, they do a great job, and I don't would never want to scare people from using them. We actually have a trial going on right now, just a short distance from here in the federal courthouse, a lady named Latoya Moorhead. She was an Avondale resident. She worked as a tax return preparer. She was filing tax returns using information from former clients, and she was also using uh, information from non-clients. So this is, these are not mistakes. These are not people, you know, someone, well, I just, they should have, they did something improper. These are people with intent trying to take money from the government and using people as the vehicle to do that. And, and as far as the state is concerned, we, we're talking about fraud again. We're talking about ID theft. If the tax return preparer is doing this and it's found out, how do you learn about this? Do you, I mean, how do you know that your tax return preparer is messing around with your stuff? 
I mean, I don't know how you're going to learn it. There's a couple signs that you could look for. I mean, if you go in and they're going to tell you up front, here's how much refund we're going to get you. Well, there's something wrong there. Or if you're going to walk in and they're going to tell you, uh, I'll take a percentage of what you're going to get. Those kind of things are, are alerts to say this person's not legitimate in, in the way they're preparing tax returns. Okay, so is, is the state, more, in going after these kinds of folks, is there a proactive way the state can do this? Or is it, once again, wait till you find out there's a problem? Uh, a lot of it is wait to find out and see what you can do. We can proactively do it in the sense of if we start seeing tax returns that look bad and see that there's a particular ta uh, preparer signed up, we can go that route. But for the most part, it's when we find out. And, and the same question for you, mm -hmm. not just preparers, but in all aspects of scams and of fraud, uh, how proactive can the IRS be? Well, we, we have a dedicated teams. We have these scheme development centers, and they look for fraudulent patterns. They look for, for if you have a return prepare whose refund rate is almost 100%, draws a few red flags. So we start looking at it more closely, and we look at some other numbers. We can pull some of them for audit. And it's just based on the numbers, because when millions of returns are being filed, we can see patterns. And if certain things are upticks, that's usually like an indicator that something fraudulent is going on. So with everything we're talking about here and folks are watching at home and they want to avoid these particular problems, they maybe have so far, or maybe they know someone like you who hasn't, what do you do? Well, I mean, to avoid identity theft, you need to guard your financial information. Make sure your computer has antivirus software, you know, the protections on it. Be very careful what websites you go to. Don't fall for the phishing scams. You have to protect your financial information because if you don't, you're going you're to end up paying for it later on down the road. And sometimes, though, you could do absolutely everything right and someone could hack into some company's website and you might be a victim. So don't stay up at night worrying about it because you might not be able to stop it. Your thoughts on that? Same thing. I think you have to really um, watch what you're doing. Take care of your, don't, don't give any information over the phone. Uh, first of all, either the IRS or us are not going to call you and ask you for that kind of information. All right. Good stuff, guys. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. In tonight's edition of Arizona Art Beat, we recognize the struggling artist within us. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Ed Kishel introduce us to a place where you can unleash your inner Picasso. The creativity is in full force on a Thursday night at Painting with a Twist. Painting with a Twist is a place where you can come with your friends or family and you find your inner artist. The new business in Tempe is hoping to inspire the artist in everyone, and you don't need to know a Matisse from a Renoir. Owner Chernell Mays brings in local artists who can teach you how to paint like a pro. I feel bringing local artists into our studio not only helps them build their clientele with their personal art, but also just having them, our customers coming in and seeing that we're supporting our local artists, that's the most important thing. Each night showcases a different genre. In this session, students are learning about Impressionism through the work of Vincent van Gogh and his famous painting, Starry Night. The students learn how to hold a brush to mimic van Gogh's brushstroke look. They also work with bright colors to achieve the rich look in the original painting. Every move of the artist teacher is broadcast on a monitor so students can follow along. An artist teaching me is a lot better, like a pathway, you know, I honestly, when I look at the painting, I don't think I can do it. But when she sits there and walks it step by step, I'm like, oh, if mine looks just like hers and hers looks perfect, like, I can do it. I can do it. Having like a professional artist show you the ropes helps a whole lot because they're very um, step by step. It's more like a paint by number. So it's not as crazy as you just looking at the painting and having to do it yourself. That definitely helps. Recreating a masterpiece can feel a bit daunting, but you do get a little help here thanks to the twist, a chance to sip while you paint. BYOB helps because most people come in here, they're nervous, they're, they can't paint, they feel like they can't paint. So bringing in a little wine helps them relax and helps them get loose and they create beautiful art. The bring your own beverage, I think it has a different twist on it because it loosens you up a little bit. You can open up with everybody, talk to your neighbor. You, you just go with the paint, just go with it. <laughs> Painting with a twist uses acrylic paints, so they dry quickly, which means you get to take home your artwork at the end of the night, along with some great memories. It's more than the art. 
it's how you feel when you leave. Most people feel like they accomplished something and they know that they had a great time and it's something that they want to continue to do. Painting with a Twist's involvement in the community includes donating a portion of their proceeds to a different charity each month. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable, an update on the many bills being considered in the waning days of the legislative session. And we will discuss what's next in the campaign finance case against Attorney General Tom Horn. That's Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. The Global Institute of Sustainability is the heart of ASU's sustainability initiatives, advancing research, education, and business practices for an urbanizing world. Learn more about ASU sustainability at sustainability.asu.edu/tv.